and welcome to this presentation today on how to be a successful risk management consultant. My name is Julian Talbot and I'll be sharing today the things which have worked for me and how I define success. First let me also say thank you to Alex for inviting me to speak here at Risk Awareness Week 2019. What a great initiative and there are so many terrific speakers here. What a terrific lineup of people. Now I've been a, a risk management consultant for more years than I care to remember, about three decades perhaps at last count. Uh, in fact, I've been a consultant in a number of fields, including risk management uh, and a couple of subsets of risk management, such as safety and security. I've also been a consultant in IT and in areas like business process re-engineering, contract management, property portfolios. So I've, I've worked in a range of fields and I'll talk broadly today about what works as a consultant and bring them together into the space of risk management consulting particularly. Now I've worked and lived on about five continents so far now and around the world. I've worked for a range of government organisations and private sector and not-for-profits in the mining, oil and gas, commercial, IT and of course broadly government sector. Now I worked a lot of my time as a consultant and a lot as an employee and I'm going to talk about the differences between those and I think it's fair to say I've alternated from one position to the other and being a client side being an employee of a large organization and recruiting consultants and then being a consultant has also given me an appreciation for both sides of the equation and I think it's made me a better consultant it certainly made me a better client and it's given me a lot of insights into what the consulting business is all about. So both how to hire consultants and how to be a good consultant. So it's just purely Julian Talbot's version of how to be a successful risk management consultant. And the emphasis I'm going to talk about here today is on successful because if you just want to be a risk management consultant, all you need is a business card. But in reality, there's a lot more to it than that, and I'm sure anybody who's worked in this space already knows that. The role where I had the most to do with hiring consultants was my role as manager of the Australian Trade Commission's property and security. And in that area, because we had so much on, we had a massive expansion program with a $60 million program of works. So we needed to work with a lot of consultants and we needed to rapidly hire some of the best people we could find. Uh, I've also worked as a senior risk advisor for the Department of Health and Aging in Australia and in that area we used a lot of consultants, particularly we would help other areas of the business to find the right consultants for their projects and their works. Many years ago I think my first true consulting role was as an IT consultant working in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney just for myself and I grew that into a small team for about five people working for me and then I went back into a role as a, a manager working employee side for a large organization. Uh, later I went back to that organization which was Woodside Energy as a uh, first a contractor and then a consultant and then employee. Through a long story I ended up in Canberra as the risk management practice leader for a company called Jakeman Business Solutions. This was a company that uh, Miles Jakeman founded and a group of us were co-founding shareholders of this. Essentially it was an organization where a group of us who enjoyed each other's company wanted to spend more time together and we thought we all, we all enjoyed good red wine and we all enjoyed each other's company and what better way to facilitate that than by actually working together. So in that organisation I was the risk management practice leader, uh, essentially in charge of consulting, uh, the main consultant but also heading up a number of consultants in risk management there, mostly for government clients but also for a range of private sector and not-for-profit organisations. And then I, I left there, as, as I do with Itchy Feet every now and again, and I ended up living in Cambodia and then working in Africa as a uh, operations manager for an exploration camp. That started out initially loosely as a contracting role and became a management role. And then after a few years there, uh, Jakeman Business Solutions had grown into Citadel Group, and I came back to be the CEO of Jakeman Business Solutions and then the divisional manager of Citadel Group. And in that role, I was responsible for managing and leading teams of consultants and, and indeed project managers and a whole range of uh, different activities but primarily consulting into risk management, security, information technology, business process, re-engineering, those sorts of activities. So I've seen a lot of different avenues working 
for myself working as a client side hiring consultants and working as a CEO and manager responsible for a team of consultants. So with all that in mind, here is my broad view, overview of it. And I'm going to talk firstly about the four different categories as I see them. So it's being a contractor, or sorry, being an employee, a contractor, a consultant, and then a owner of a consulting business. Now an employee can of course be working for any of the large groups, Google or Amazon or uh, as an employee in that company. But in this particular instance, I'm talking about being an employee of a company which does risk management consulting. So you work as a risk consultant, but as an employee, perhaps for one of the big four, or perhaps for a much smaller organization that nobody apart from you and your favorite clients have ever heard of. But in this instance, you, the benefits are that you have a regular salary and you have paid annual leave and never underestimate the joy of paid annual leave, nor the other benefit, which is that you won't have any admin to do. Certainly you'll have your own expenses probably to look after. You might have uh, travel reporting and you might need to do some marketing. But generally speaking, you are left to do the job of a consultant. Now, the downside, of course, of that is that you are still selling your time. And although there's a continuity of income and your salary is more or less guaranteed, you're still selling time and hours. Now, on, on another a next step, if you like, on the evolution is working as a contractor where you're still selling time, but you don't have a steady salary and you don't have any uh, annual leave guaranteed. And you've probably got more work to do in terms of admin. You might be working as a, uh, a private contractor with your own company contracting in. And de definitely in this situation, you probably won't have continuity of guaranteed work but you will be working on ongoing basis on a daily rate, typically, or perhaps an hourly rate. So this is a situation where a company might call you in as a contractor to sit in a seat for 60 days or 100 days or indefinite, open-ended, to work as if you were an, were an employee, but essentially being a third party, a consultant, if you like, on a, a risk management project. Now, that, the downside of that is you're still selling your time and you're not getting annual leave. The plus is that you're probably making more money. And inevitably, this is one of the reasons why people do it. Perhaps also the flexibility, because you can choose to come and go as you see fit and you can accept or reject various contracting engagements. The next step along there, I would say, is as a consultant, where you're working for a client organization on either a daily rate or perhaps a fixed price rate. And I'll talk about the differences later, but you're essentially being paid fee for service. And generally speaking, it doesn't matter whether you are there or not. Sometimes it does. If you're working on sensitive information or you're running training or you're doing something which needs you to physically be there. But quite often as a true consultant, you are independent often on a lump sum fixed price for delivering a report or some analysis or whatever it might be. And then you can go home and work in your pyjamas, you can work in a coffee shop, you can work from midnight to 4am if that's what suits you. You have that flexibility as a consultant. Downside is that you probably have a lot more admin, you're working, doing your own marketing to find the next job. You are also responsible for your own insurances. You have extra paperwork to do. Um, you're probably making more money, but you're also not getting paid annual leave. And I'm, I'm just going to emphasize that this is something as a consultant, you'll have to get used to not having paid annual leave. As an employee, you have your four weeks or however many you've managed to negotiate. And you can go and lie on a tropical island, content with the knowledge that you're still being paid, and that when you get back, you'll have a job to go back to. As a consultant or indeed a contractor, every day that you're lying on that tropical island beach or in the snow fields or wherever you happen to be on holiday, um, at the back of your mind is still that this is costing me $2,000 a day or $1,000 a day or $5,000 a day or whatever your uh, particular daily rate is. And so you just need to learn to switch that off because trust me, it will burn you out if you try to keep working and you think in those sort of terms. So you do need to be able to put aside some extra money. After all, your daily rate should be making a lot more money than you were as an employee. So you need to 
fund that annual leave yourself and be able to allow yourself to switch off and enjoy it and recharge. Now the fourth scenario here is running a consulting business where either as a shareholder or well, a partner perhaps, but ideally as a shareholder, maybe 100% shareholder if it's totally your business, or more typically as a shareholder with a group of other colleagues and friends or at least people that you trust and like. Um, in this case, you can work on a salary, you can have paid annual leave, you can have a share of the profits according to your shareholding, you will be working more on the business than in the business, you'll probably have a team of people doing most of the consulting work, and I say most because inevitably the clients do want to see you and you are often the rainmaker or the person who has the relationships. Often you are the person who grew the business to that point, so you're still connected with a lot of the primary consultant clients there. But in this sort of scenario, you can take a holiday and come back with more money in the bank than when you went away. You can also spend a lot of time working on the business, which is sometimes some of the more interesting parts of it, working on the business strategy and the marketing and getting the right teams of people together, talking about the value proposition, thinking about perhaps an exit strategy for the business, thinking about growth strategies. So this is a different mindset. And this is probably where I would steer you towards. I would suggest that it's almost, a, if you like, a, an escalation from an employee to a contractor to a true consultant working on a fixed price for a delivery of a agreed deliverable and then to a owner of a business which does consulting. So more about that in a moment, but that's for what it's worth, that's the way I see the consulting business. The hardest thing about the consulting business is the next job, finding that next piece of work. Now sometimes you will be happily overrun and swamped with work and that's a wonderful way to be. But even when you are fully flat out and indeed overstretched and working 16 hour days, you always have to be mindful that the next two months might have nothing. So that there needs to be something happening all the time to find the next piece of work and that's simply the hardest part. Now. The second hardest part is always scoping the brief. Inevitably, my experience is that clients will have a coffee shop meeting and say, we would like to do X. And X sounds very simple. It might be a risk assessment of project ABC. It might be developing a risk management training program, or it might be a safety plan, whatever it is. And then the client will always give you this little get out of jail card. In fact, for them, it's a get out of jail free. For, for you, it's more work. <laughs> For you as the consultant, the client will probably say, can you give me a proposal to do X? And you said, yes, it sounds very simple. But what the client is actually asking you to do is to scope the brief. And quite often the text that will be in your proposal is going to end up as the scoping statement for the report which you eventually deliver. So this, and sometimes I've been on projects where I've said, look, simply this is such a big project, I need to come and work for you for 30 or 40 days on a daily rate to scope this out because this is a, a multi-million dollar or multi-billion dollar program and just scoping it requires several weeks of work. Other times it can be relatively simple and can be defined with a couple of emails back and forward. What's in scope? What's out of scope? Geographic locations? Departments? Do we look at the information technology systems or just the information that are on the systems? You know, the, these sort of discussions. And the, the third difficult part is that a lot of jobs have, even if they have a clear scope or you've defined the scope with the client, often there is a subtext or some underlying reason why this engagement has been required. It might be because they need to develop a program for funding. They need to have an argument to fund some particular strategies which will become, if not already obvious, will become very clear and easy to understand once you've done that risk assessment. Sometimes it might be training management about risk management it might actually be training to resolve a particular problem with I don't know, vehicle accidents or injuries or financial losses. So it's understanding why you're doing something, not just with the obvious stated intentions, but the underlying subplot, if you like. Sometimes it can take you a little while to learn what this is, but you need to have it always at the back of your mind with every interview and every discussion and every piece of paper that you're examining, 
what is happening in the background and who's going to be affected by this and why am I being asked to do this? Why, what is the end result that this organization wants to achieve? And, and it's not a risk report. They don't want another piece of shelfware, a piece of paperwork, say, thank you, I'll put that in the shelf, done. They're looking for an outcome and that outcome is not always stated in the scope. So, so they're the three things. Find the next job, define the brief, and then develop the underlying context. Now, successful means something different to everybody. We can talk about money, which obviously is a reason why a lot of people do get into consulting. Other people get into it for the freedom. Maybe some because they've been retrenched and they, they just wanted a change or they don't have any choice and they need to make a change. There are a whole range of reasons why you might do it, but ultimately how you define success is a very personal thing. And that might mean a six-figure income or if you're in Tanzania, which is uh, 10,000 shillings is worth about five US dollars, uh, a six-figure income isn't going to get you very far. But if you're in the United States or Great Britain or Europe, how, wherever you are, you might be defining a successful financial outcome as earning more than you were as an employee. Or you might even just define it as earning as much as you were as an employee, but having more freedom. There's sort of a two-year rule of thumb, which we talk about, and, and that is for the first year after you leave your job, you're going to make less than you earned as an employee. In the second year, you're going to start to learn the craft of consulting and develop a client base and a track record, and you'll be earning probably as much as you were as an employee. And in the third year, you'll probably be earning more, if you choose to be at least, if you want to work the same sort of hours and work full-time you'll be earning more than you were when you were working as an employee. But that's the two year rule of thumb and sorry, that's just the way it is. If you are just getting by week to week and want to try your hand at consulting, I'd strongly recommend you have a fair buffer in the bank just to cope with that first couple of years of lean periods because it really does take a while unless you're incredibly lucky or you've walked into something and you're leaving your job for an existing consulting uh, opportunity the two-year rule is probably worth thinking about. Success in this as freedom. I can come and go, choose the jobs that I want to work on, the clients I want to work with, the countries that I want to be in. Uh, I can take time off when I want to, if I want to go sailing or swimming or flying or scuba diving, ride my motorcycle on a trip through the Pyrenees. Then to, to a large extent, not, not totally, obviously I still need to pay the bills, but I can choose when I work on what what projects I work and with which clients. I also love the fact that it's a lot of variety. You know, you'll meet someone who's had the, arguably 10 years of experience, but some people with 10 years of experience have really only had the same year 10 times. And we've all met somebody like that, very content in their job, very good at it, but really it's the same year 10 times over. That will never be the case if you're working as a consultant. Every year will be different, every project will be different. If you're working in an engineering environment, you'll pick up skills and knowledge about how engineers frame risk management. And then you go to work in a financial institution on another project, and you'll start to learn how financial institutions view risk management, safety, security, derivatives, insurance. You know, there are all these various elements, and they all have their own skill sets and tool set, which you can use to define or indeed take from one job to another. So the variety is fabulous and the variety delivers learning. And that's another reason why I love consulting. You never stop learning, never ever stop learning. In fact, I would say a simple rule of thumb, if you want to be successful as a consultant, put aside an average of one hour a day to read and preferably books because I'll have a very deep dive into your knowledge, but books or periodicals. Uh, sometimes you can find good information on YouTube and on documentaries but I find the best learning is in a, in a solid book and just one hour a day is, well, you know, if, even if it's seven hours on a Sunday, an average of one hour a day will give you 50 books a year. In five years, you've read 250 books on pick your topic and you will be basically in that top 1% of people on that subject. Whatever your subject is, if it's derivatives or safety management, one hour a day can put you into the top 1% of the skill set of your consultants. So the other thing I do like personally is the accountability and 
not only the accountability for the work you deliver, which is always part and parcel of any job, and, and that's key in consulting because it really is your next, your best marketing is your last work, but also the accountability for how you manage the business, how you manage the finances, how you do the marketing, whether the business is successful or not. And, and personally, I really enjoy that. If you don't like that, well, give, give it a try, but maybe consulting isn't, isn't the right job for you. The income stops when you stop, and that's simply the worst thing about consulting. But it's that thing about taking a holiday and knowing at the back of your mind that it's costing you a couple of thousand dollars a day because you're not working. So you have to learn to switch that off and you need to learn to plan for the lean times. And there will be quiet periods and lean times. And sometimes you will go a month or two months, three months with no work. And you'll think, what have I done wrong? Is it just me? Am I not doing enough marketing? And certainly you can do all the marketing in the world. And sometimes things just don't fall into place. And then for whatever reason, maybe it's the end of financial year, and all your clients suddenly have to spend all their money before the end of financial year and you are deluged. It's a downside of consulting that you can't always choose and manage the time frame there. But if you can just learn to live with the idea that your income will be volatile, you'll probably make more money and you will also have more time off. So that's still a bit of a plus really. The two most important things, and there's not one thing, but there are two most important things about consulting as a business. One is working on the business, doing the marketing, doing the admin, the strategy, the paperwork, thinking about it, recruiting the right people to work with you, even if they're just working on a, occasional projects, you need to have the right group of people around you that you can call on for their expertise. Maybe you need someone who can do a cultural survey, and if that's not your background, hopefully you already know someone or you can find someone, so you need to be developing a network of people who can support your accountants and solicitors and what have you. But the second most important thing is doing the work. So working in the business. And you're only as good as your last job. It is true in most industries, I think, but especially so in consulting. And it's not even necessarily your last, last job. It's the last relevant job. So it's the last job that you did that's relevant to what this client needs. So the two things, Two most important things, and I can't separate. If I had to prioritize, I would say working in the business because if you're not delivering value to clients, then you'll very quickly run out of clients. But equally, if you're not working on the business, you're not really creating a sustainable lifestyle or a sustainable income stream. So these are just my practical tips for becoming a consultant. If you're not already a consultant, or perhaps even if you already are, this is just my list of things to think about. So are you going to be brand you or are you going to be a company? Is it going to be fredsmith.com or you know, in my case, juliantalbot.com or Citadel Group Limited or whatever it is, the time you need to have a clear idea of who you are and what you are. Another question to think about is your structure. Do you want to be a sole trader or a partnership or a company? And I would always argue for a company because of the protection that it gives you from liability, the ability to bring in more shareholders, the ability to establish a board, uh, perhaps even an exit strategy later on, or to sell to a, another larger organisation. So you have to make a decision about how you want to operate. So having an exit strategy is really uh, a great thing to think about at the start. Do you want to build up to an IPO? You know, as we did with Citadel Group, that was at the back of the mind 10 years before it even happened, although we had a range of options about continuing the business on or a trade sale or just um, selling it in parts, but eventually an IPO became the best strategy for us. But we always clearly built the business from day one with a board of directors, a good governance structure, so that we could easily have an exit strategy should we want to. Getting a team together is essential and you'll need probably an intellectual property solicitor, you need a contract lawyer, you'll need a range of people, bookkeepers and the like, but the first place to start would be an accountant. And I have a wonderful accountant, which I've been with for 20 years now, but I found him after meeting with a lot of accountants and interviewing nine accountants, and has been such an important part of my success, does so much of the work that I would struggle to do and that I don't enjoy doing, quite frankly, like bookkeeping and tax returns 
and research into structures and arrangements and superannuation funds and trusts and this sort of thing. This is his bread and butter and he's worth every penny. And this is probably one of the first places to start in terms of building a team if you don't already have a good accountant. Value proposition and having a unique value proposition is so fundamental. You know, I spoke about this idea of reading a book a week and becoming in the top 1% of your skill set. You and your skills and your background are going to shape your unique value proposition. And perhaps the team of people, if you choose to become a company, will shape the value proposition. So if your background is information technology or it's in human resources or it's in law, think about building on this now. Scott Adams, the creator of the Dilbert cartoon, has a very good take on this. And he said, it's, it's very difficult to be a gold medal athlete or be in the top 1% of anything in the world. But it's quite easy to be in the top 1% of the two or three things that you are very good at. And in his case, for example, he's very good at cartoons. So he's very good at office humor and he's very good at understanding business culture. So humor, cartoons and business culture, they're the three sort of things in which, as Dilbert argues, if you can, well, sorry, if Scott Adams argues, if you can be in the top 25% of two or three different things, when you combine those three, you'll be in the top 1% of that particular category and that becomes your unique value proposition. So a marketing strategy, there's so much written on this, but again, that one hour a day for reading up could well be used with some good books on marketing. But in this day and age, it's a question of social media, of conferences, of presenting, of face-to-face, -face, of relationships. And how you do that is going to depend on you and your approach. I know some people who do no social media whatsoever and they are still quite successful. I know others who make social media uh, a huge part of their business and they are very successful. And I know others who focus on social media for a couple of years only to give it away because it's not working for them. So the next step, think about your ideal client. This will change. Uh, the, as they say, the, uh, the best laid plans never survive contact with the enemy. And although you need to start with an idea of who your ideal client is, you may well find this changes. Inevitably, it will probably change over time as you respond to the market and your offerings evolve and the clients that you end up working with will change. Uh, another area that's often overlooked when people start as a consultant is thinking about the IT systems I'll use. You know, will you use social media? Will you use Mac or Apple systems? Will you use Windows or Linux? Um, will you use software as a service online such as Trello and Slack and Monday? Will you use MS Office? Uh, will you use a customer relationship management system? Which one will you use? Do you want to use MailChimp or Insightly or a different Zoho perhaps? Uh, there are a host to choose from. So, you know, Zoho is probably one of the most integrated and it's a good place to start with. Another thing you'll need is a, a website and a web presence. I use Wix.com. I can set up websites. I can build a WordPress site. I don't want to do that. I want to work as a consultant or as an author. I don't want to work as a website designer and I don't want to pay someone to do it when I can pay $10 a month to have a website that just runs and I can update in two minutes. You're also going to need to think about how your pension scheme works, whether that's a superannuation plan or a 401k or an IRA or whichever part of the world you're in. But I would say as a good risk manager, it's essential that you have that plan for the future. Not only is it tax effective, it's also forced saving and it's protected by law, should something go wrong with your company, if you're sued or you just run into debt, it's a little bit of a nest egg you can put away. So last but not least, and I'm going to talk about this topic, and I know as a risk manager or talking to you as an experienced risk professional, I don't need to mention insurance, but I just feel I should anyway, because there are any number of insurances that you'll need, property, motor vehicle, travel, you, know, you name it, it could be anything. But I would say three that you must have as a consultant, professional indemnity, public liability, and workers' compensation. They might be called different things in your country, but these are the three categories. One which covers you and all your staff if you become injured at work. Another which covers you for public liability if something that you do causes a problem for a client. And last but not least, perhaps most importantly even, is professional indemnity. A lot of clever clients won't even work with you if you don't have those three insurances. That 
if you're just doing one or two projects as a consultant, maybe you don't want to pay the money for these insurances and they can be quite expensive, especially professional indemnity insurance. So there is a way to get around that and to avoid having them, but still have them. <laughs> and, and that is, if you find a client who wants you to do a particular job, you can then go to a personnel agency or to a, another consulting house, preferably someone that you know and trust, and say, look, I have this job, it's worth X amount of dollars and the client would like me to do it. I would like to put it through your books, through your invoicing, and you can have 10% in return for doing the paperwork and providing the insurances and paying me as an employee and putting the money into superannuation and paying the tax for me. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. And many times that's uh, much safer and simpler. There's certainly a lot less paperwork with setting up that way than setting up your own company, buying your own insurances, especially if you're only doing one or two jobs. I would strongly recommend that you do that through a, an employment agency or through another consulting house. So imagine you're making $100,000 a year as an employee. You're probably billing 200 days or working 200 days. But that $100,000 that you earn as salary has to then have at least 33% on top, or maybe 50% on top, even double realistically, because you're not going to be working 200 days per year. So you need to think, well, I need to earn perhaps $200,000 per year to be able to pay my insurances, pay taxes, provide the superannuation or pension on top of my salary, provide marketing costs, legal costs, accounting costs. So then you need to say, okay, well, if I'm earning $200,000 per year, I'm probably going to work maybe 150. Let's say I can work if I can work 200 days per year, then I can get by with charging $1,000 per day. If I think I can only work 100 days per year, then I need to charge $2,000 per day. Now that's all well and good in this wonderful world where we're dreaming up how much we'd like to earn and we can start with saying, I'd like to earn $10,000 per day. But there is this point where you meet clients and clients say, well, we don't pay $10,000 per day to consultants. We perhaps have a set rate of fees or we like you and let us know what you charge. But at the back of their mind, there is always a maximum amount that they can afford. You need to think about two scenarios. One is a lump sum price, and that's based on value. And that's a situation where you deliver a product, a report or a training program or whatever it might be, and you receive a fee in exchange. So you do the assessment, you do a risk treatment plan, deliver those to the client with an invoice and the client then pays you. And you may have done that in a coffee shop. You may never even have seen their offices. In reality, you'll probably need to work in their offices at some point, uh, at least for interviewing people, running workshops, looking at some of the paperwork. And if it's a sensitive or security classified uh, area that you're working in, you almost certainly will need to do all if, or at least most of the work in their environment. The scenarios are essentially either that fixed price, which I recommend if you can do it, or a daily rate. And if you don't have a clear scope, you have to go with the daily rate because you can't fix price on something which isn't defined. So make that decision. Preferably, I recommend working on a lump sum basis. It's simply, if you know what you're charging then you and you know what you're delivering, then you have a, should have a good level of certainty that you can deliver it within that time frame. Generally speaking, you can often make a better daily rate too. If you can, if you think it's going to take you 50 and you work long hours and weekends and you deliver it in 30 days, maybe it's still the same amount of hours. Maybe you're working 10 hour, 12 hour days, but it's less days and so you're making more money per month and per year. And sometimes the client doesn't care how many days you put into it. They only care about the value. And if you're doing a fixed price, I would suggest that you think about the value of what you're delivering to the client. If it saves them $2 million then, and you charge $1 million, then it's a win-win. Again, you've got to be realistic. If it's 10 days work, they're probably not going to pay you a million dollars for it. But have a think about how much value it is to the client and think about pricing your work based on that. And if you can't come up with a reasonable amount, if you're only, let's say you're doing something which will take you six months of work and it's only delivering $100,000 worth of value to the client, and you'd go to them with a $200,000 fee for six months of work, 
Um, they're probably not going to take it unless they're crazy. Uh, you probably shouldn't be doing it either because if you're not delivering value at the end of the day, then it's really, it's only going to leave you with um, a tarnished reputation perhaps, or at best without delivering the sort of value that you know you're capable of doing. Sometimes you're going to be stuck with clients' procurement rules and it doesn't matter if you're really clear about the value, really clear about the scope, and really clear about how much you'd like to charge. The client may say, sorry, our procurement rules are that we can only pay you $1,850 per day maximum and you have to work in our offices on our IT systems and you have to be there every day. And then it's up to you to choose. It's a bit of a value equation, you know. Personally, I'd rather have a fixed price and work in a coffee shop, come to the client's offices when I need to, go to the client's sites, do the trips to the field if I need to, but you have to be reactive to what the client can do. There's another strategy which I use and it's not simply about the value which is often hard to quantify because you don't know the client's business that well perhaps just yet. So there's a P90, P50, P10 process which I use and that's simply looking at the job and then defining the scope over a period of a few emails and a scoping document and looking at it and saying well I'm 90% confident so almost certain that I could finish this piece of work in 40 days and so at $3,000 per day my bill for this at $120,000, 90% confident I can deliver it for $120,000, meet my daily rate requirement and deliver a product that's at least what the client asked for, if not better. But there's a 50-50 probability that I could do it in 30 days. And so that might be your P50 is 30 days. So 30 days times $3,000, it's a $90,000 price. And then you've got this P10, which is a 10% so if everything goes perfectly right, like absolutely everything works out well and there's no delays on the client side and the information is as stated and all the things that you need to happen happen, you might be able to do this in 20 days. And 20 days at $3,000 per day is a $60,000 job. You say, well, I've got a 10% chance of doing that. If the client is really uh, driven by price, you might then choose to say, well, okay, for $60,000, I'll do that, but if these things happen, if these don't, then I'm going to need to charge you $90,000. And if these other things are not available at the time I need them, or your team can't turn around my documents for review within a, a three-day period, then the price will become $120,000. So even if you first go there with a $120,000 price, at least you've got some understanding of where your price points might be. And so if the client is particularly price sensitive, you should already know what it is that you can ratchet down, that you can say, hey, if we tighten these up, we can deliver on this and I can understand exactly what's needed. The um, top down, bottom up, middle out. And the top down is just a price looking at it from the scenario and say, look, I think this is a hundred days work, my price is. Bottom up is looking at it of every single step that needs to be involved and how many hours are involved in that meeting, how many days are involved in looking at that analysis, how many days are it required to do a trip to the client's site in the Middle East or whatever it might be, and then working it step by step. And the middle out is just a bit of a bit of fun really. Um, but essentially if you look at those P90, P50, P10, that gives you one version of the pricing in terms of your confidence that you could deliver it. And the top down is your, for this I think I can do all the work that's been scoped and the bottom up is here's all the work step by step, like a, a work breakdown structure for a project, hours, days, etc. So they're the, the methods I use to establish a um, billing. And sometimes it's so big you just need to say, oh, we need to do 10 days work together on a daily rate to scope this because it is um, such a big project and the definition itself is quite a body of work. Our best tip for marketing, uh, be seen, be popular. Be the Obvious Expert. There's a great book of this same name, The Obvious Expert, which has hundreds of tips about how to be the person that when someone has a problem and they and their colleague says, well, the obvious expert for this is your name. <laughs> so you want to be that obvious expert, the first person people think about for it. I think writing articles and presentations at conferences and the like, presentations at online conferences like this one, for example, and YouTube are one of the ways to use recognition bias to get you in front of people. So it's the way that you can 
Um, you know, and recognition bias is one of these wonderful biases and heuristics that we all know about in risk management. Decision making, it's the reason that car companies spend so much money on advertising, not because they think you're going to buy that particular car right there and then, but when you do go looking for a car, when you see a brand that you recognize, we are programmed to trust it and to think of it. If we recognize it, it must be a good thing. And so your name, your company name, your brand, it's just part of being seen and being known. Marketing is all about relationships. And so if you don't, if you're not a likable sort of person and you don't, you have trouble forging good relationships, then I suggest you either don't do consulting or you work with a business partner who is very good at relationships. Uh, so if you're technically fantastically proficient, but don't get on well with people, you need to be working with someone or a team of people who actually can sustain the relationships because consulting is very much a relationship business. So your work is your best marketing tool, your last job. Whenever you apply for a tender or write a proposal, the client is going to want to see where you've done this sort of work before. And often they're going to ring for references and often they will have come to you because someone that they know has recommended you because you did such a great job. So. There's an old saying, don't promise the world and then deliver an atlas. Promise what you can deliver and then deliver it. If you are promising to deliver a Toyota or a Volkswagen or a Rolls Royce, by all means throw in the air conditioning and the sound system for free and exceed expectations, but don't deliver the Toyota or the Volkswagen or whatever without four wheels and without all the things that need to make it run. So this is just meeting expectations and part of that is managing expectations by having a clear scope and regular communication, but it's simply just deliver what you promise. Another important aspect is going back to pricing. Price the job correctly, because if you don't, you will either find yourself out of work because you're too expensive, or you'll find yourself out of work because you'll be in the cardiac unit at the local hospital because you've been working long, long hours and not earning enough money to feed your family and pay the rent and the bills. So experience is the best teacher of this, but at the start, if you can do some initial analysis that will probably help you save that problem of underpricing or overpricing. Another great book for aspiring or current consultants is Million Dollar Consulting by Alan Weiss. Now, essentially, he says a lot of things, but he talks about pricing correctly and lump sum pricing as a consultant should be the main focus that you're looking at and growing the business. There's no limit to growth if you have the right value proposition and the right relationships. And if you've got a really unique relationship with a client and a unique proposition, then you know that's half the work done there and then. So there's no limit to how large you can grow a consulting business. I think in reality, there are no difficult clients or there are very few. My first assumption is that there's been some miscommunication, perhaps about scope or timing or in the relationship or perhaps one of the people in, in my team are not delivering or one of the somebody in the client's team are not delivering or there's been some miscommunication. And often, quite simply, clients like the rest of us, they have issues at home, they have a new baby, they might have uh, a whole range of jobs and work at home that have landed in their lap. They might have a boss who's very difficult to deal with. They may have problems going on anywhere else in their life and other projects or other consultants, so it may not even be you, which makes them seem to be difficult. But just persevere, assume that it's all for the best, communicate, find out what's going on, and just conclude it. On the rare occasion where I do find a, a truly difficult client, and there are some who will promise, yes, you've got this job, ramp up for it, bring on the team that you need, set up for it, and then cancel at the last minute. There are others who will, uh, seek to creep the scope without any additional payment. And certainly I don't mind delivering more if, it, if it's a little bit of effort to deliver a little bit more or even a lot more, but it doesn't take much effort. Absolutely, it's always yes. But sometimes you'll find clients always want more. The more you give, the more they want, and you have this enormous amount of scope creep. And it, it doesn't end well, it doesn't end. It, it's always ongoing. And I've known clients where I've dragged out a due date by months 
literally turned a three month project into 12 months before you receive payment on that invoice. And so when you do meet clients like that, it's simple, finish the work, do a great job and never ever work for them again. And it's simple as that, life is too short. Be strategic about the qualifications that you choose as a consultant. So think very carefully about the certifications or the short courses or the diploma courses or degrees that you do. When I did a master's degree, I was thought long and hard about why I was doing it and what I was doing it for. I also gave a lot of thought to which master's program I was doing. First, let me say why I chose a master of risk management and not a master degree of business administration or a master of security science or safety science or finance. But I wanted to be broad, but not too broad. So an MBA is a wonderful qualification, but it is a very uh, wide ranging qualification. It doesn't give you a clear area. So in general management, it's fantastic. To work in this area of, uh, let's say a master of security science, I already had 20 years experience in security. Our, Equally, a Master of Safety Science. I already had a uh, Diploma of Occupational Health and Safety. I'd already worked for a number of years in the field of safety. But a Master of Risk Management had this wonderful ability to work in any area and to work as to bring some value to a board, for example, on, on a company board of directors, to bring value to a client, to work as a, a manager, a general manager or a CEO. And it gave me also a very clear skill set when it came to risk management consulting. Now, I had a choice of two universities to do it. One was the University of New South Wales, where the risk management was run in the School of Safety and Engineering. And the other was Monash University. And there they ran it in the School of Finance and Banking. You know, I mentioned I already had started first year engineering. I already had a diploma of safety. So I thought, well, I'm not going to get as much from going through that school as I would if I went through the finance and banking. And some of their courses were built on foundations of finance and banking and law and insurance in these areas. So I chose the Monash course. Now, obviously there are hundreds around the world you could choose from. I'm just giving you the example that I had narrowed it down to. So I was quite strategic about what I chose, how I did it and where I went because I knew, and if I just wanted the knowledge, I could simply put the same amount of time and effort into reading and into doing short courses, but by enrolling for a master's degree, it gave me not just the knowledge, but the qualification which I could use as a credential. As a consultant, your CV will be very short. You don't give them the seven page CV that you might for a job application or even three or two. Almost invariably, your CV should be a one page profile. And so it's not for the client. The client already likes you, has a relationship, has read your proposal, has had some meetings with you probably, and probably wants to work with you, which is the reason you've gotten this far. But they need to convince their boss because usually it's the boss who's signing off on the expense, on the purchase order. And when your client goes to their boss with a piece of paper that says, Julian has done a lot of work in this field and he's a great guy, they say, well, you know, I know he's a great guy, but does he have the experience and the credentials? Maybe I should meet him, or maybe I should look at somebody else who's actually got more credentials. But when he sees a profile, it says his certification in this, he's a fellow of the Risk Management Institution of Australasia, has a Master of Risk Management, has a couple of other relevant jobs that have been done recently, consulting work, then it makes it much easier for your client's manager to say, yep, great, you've got the right guy, um, here's the paperwork and move on. So always remember that CV isn't for the person you're giving it to, it's the person that they are giving it to. As a consultant, you are going to have to spend a lot of time on marketing and paperwork and administration, and that's just the way it is. Uh, far more than you would ever think. Just trust me on that, it's probably going to be 50% of your time is going to be spent on this sort of work. Hey-ho, that's what it is. I suggest you register a company as one of the first steps and have a company with a good solid brand that's easy to remember and relevant to the field that you want to work in. It can be an acronym, so long as the acronym spells out something that resonates with the client. Um, you know, I've used a company in the past, for example, SERT, which variously was Security Emergency Response Training. 
or security emergency risk technology or <laughs> you see where I'm going. So the brand name was quite simple and it could mean whatever I wanted it to mean depending on how that business evolved over the years. I always recommend a fixed price if you and the client can agree on the scope and on that sort of contracting arrangement. It's better for everybody and it's quicker and cleaner and it's the essence of true consulting, bringing knowledge to a, deliver a solution, a product, an outcome. But sometimes the daily rate is what you need to work with. Networks and relationships. Consulting is very much about the relationships that you have. And the network's not just on the client side, but also on your colleagues because there are times when you'll need to call on advice or expertise or build a team, even sometimes a very short duration team of specialists who have the unique skills that you need to deliver a particular consulting arrangement. Now, there's a lot been written on networking and I won't attempt to even cover that here in this simple presentation, but I'll give you my view about networking, which is that it's about the quality of the relationships you have, not the quantity. And I would often go to conferences or presentations, and for some people, it was all about working the room. And you could see them there, they're covering the room using their business cards like shuriken, like throwing stars, like a ninja, busy slicing them out, embedding them in people's foreheads and moving on to the next person. For me, it's not about that at all. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum. I Sometimes I've been to a conference and spoken to only half a dozen people. Certainly sometimes I've spoken to dozens and over the course of a three-day conference I'll probably meet a hundred people. But in any given social scenario, usually I'll only talk in depth to three or four people, perhaps on a coffee break or a lunch break, the people at the table around me, and get to know them. And I'll choose to spend the time with the people I like and the people who I get on with and where there's some rapport and there's a values and ethics alignment where we share the same sort of view of the world or perhaps a different view of the world but a mutual respect and, and common values and, and it's always been for me about the ethics if someone a company or an individual has the right ethics then that's the first hurdle for me and, and as I say you know sometimes I'll go to a conference and only speak to a couple of people but you've got to ask yourself do you want to get to know everybody a little bit or do you want to have some decent relationships with clients and with colleagues, people you enjoy. And, and ultimately, I would rather work with people whose company I enjoy. And so often we don't even talk about work or trying to sell my services. Um, you know, we talk about other topics. We might talk about risk management or the weather or travel or share tips for life. So it's really about the relationships for me and about quality. And sometimes most of the people I talk to never become clients, but many of them do become lifelong friends and that for me is part of the definition of success as a consultant. I'm an author. I've published four books, about to be five and probably six by the end of this year. So I have a strong bias to writing books. I think there's very few credentials that offer the same um, credibility as a good book. And I do mean a good book, uh, a crappy book is a crappy book and it won't help your reputation at all but give it your best and I've written an article just recently on my website at juliantalbot.com uh, which talks about my process for writing the current book which is to have a great idea put aside a couple of weekends to write it get to the end of the second weekend and realize that I need another hundred weekends or late nights or what have you put those in run out of ideas uh, share a draft with all my mates get a few ideas back, incorporate them, and then give the book to an editor, press publish, and bask in the glory of having good mates and a great editor. <laughs> because it's always much easier to think about writing a book than it is to actually write one. But don't let me put you off, because it is doable, anybody can do it, and it's, it's getting easier every day with the technology that is out there. If you've got an idea for a book, and you think you would like to be a published author, and you've got something to say, you don't even need to be a touch typer or a great writer. Dictate it, send it off to one of these websites which will transcribe either automated or the human. Give that to an editor, they'll charge you between three and six cents per minute on Upwork. Job done, you've got something which you can then upload. And the easiest way to upload it that I know is Kindle, uh, the Amazon subsidiary. Easy, right? <laughs> but 
in reality, this they won't cost you a lot. This is a print-on-demand book. You can order them when you need them. Bring them to a consulting meeting. The thunk factor of putting a book down and leaving that with the client is far better than a business card ever will be. YouTube is fabulous and it's a great way to reach at least your mum and your best friend. <laughs> Potentially, if you're lucky, millions of people will see your YouTube channel. Just go to conferences and you speak there. You never know what's going to happen. For me, that's been one of the most successful things I've ever done as a consultant. It's a chance to speak to a room as the authority up on the stage, the chance to network and meet people and have one-on-one -on -one relationships and conversations with them afterwards. And, you know, I remember one day receiving a phone call from someone who said, hi, my name's so-and-so. I said, hi, how can I help you? And they said, I'm from this organization and I'm the chief security officer. Uh, I really like that conference presentation you did on benchmarking. And I'm thinking, benchmarking, bench oh, that's right. That was six months ago. And he said, great presentation. You had some really innovative ideas. I'd like to talk to you about coming to do some benchmarking uh, consulting or design a benchmarking framework for us. Perhaps we could meet over a cup of coffee. And that cup of coffee turned into $300,000 worth of work. And that was all from a conference presentation that I'd given six months previously and had completely forgotten about. But it does work, and for me, that's been one of the best successes. So all of the above work and all of the above are important, but books, videos, and conferences are some of the best ways that you can get your brand out there. So thanks very much for listening to my view of what makes for successful risk management consulting. I don't think risk management consulting is very different from any other form of consulting, except with the focus that you're bringing to it and thinking about the two or three things that you can be in the top 25% in the world on, your unique proposition, the way you want to reach people, and, and have fun with it. It's freedom, it's opportunity, it's learning, and it's a chance to build a business and I would indeed steer you from employee to contractor to consultant to the owner of a consulting business if you really want to take this to the nth degree and enjoy. I hope this has been useful to you. You can reach me at juliantalbot.com if you have any questions and best of luck with your consulting career. Thanks. Bye.